We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 113 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about a really exciting topic, Bob. You're looking forward to this one. It's love and hate in therapy or in the therapy room. Absolutely. A very common emotions in life and mirrored in the therapy room. Yeah. So, um, yeah. You know, like I was just going to start by saying I've got, as you can all see, oh, can't, people can't see me, of course, but if you're on my YouTube, you could. I've got a blue t shirt on, very close to Manchester City colours. Oh, he's off with his football again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now, when I go and see them, in the in that sort of t- uh, two hours I'm there, I can go through a whole myriad of feelings of love and hate. So, um, anyway, so let's talk about it in the therapy room. My dad always used to say, I think I mentioned this in the last podcast, that my dad always used to say that there's a very fine line between love and hate. And I never really understood that as a kid. But once I, I was an adult, I was kind of, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, love and hate are very intense emotions. Absolutely. And uh, specifically in romantic relationships, specifically in family relationships, sibling relationships. Yeah. The most important thing I I can say here that, that they are both very intense emotions. Yeah. And obviously they're played out in life and they're played out in the therapy room as well. When clients come to therapy, they are dealing with intense emotions. And often the intense emotions, uh, in this case, we're talking about love and hate, can get played out very much with the therapist and projected onto the therapist. And actually therapists can also uh, have tender feelings towards their clients and be exasperated with clients. So love and hate is is really um, very common in a therapy room. Yeah. Do you experience them? Do you experience it that way? I mean, both ways, in fact? Yeah, I've never really thought about it. But like you say, I think, you know, having different emotions, whether I'd say it's love and hate in the therapy room, but definitely different feelings around affection and, you know, I don't know, connection with a client and then maybe feeling frustrated or, like you said, exasperated with another one. So, yeah, yeah, and the mood can shift quite rapid, I think, in a therapy session as well. Absolutely. And we could say there's a continuum, if you want to look at that way, from frustration to irritation to... That's how it feels more for me, that there's a continuum of, of negative and positive emotions, let's say, yeah. Yeah, but you know, I'm a transactional analyst, and I mean, you are. So if we think of this developmentally, we're thinking of the younger self or child ego state. Yeah. So when a person moves into their child ego state or their younger self, they're often getting in touch with quite primitive emotions. So, for example, a young child may easily say to their uh, mother or father, I hate you because you uh, you didn't bring home the ice cream I I asked for. I hate you because you didn't buy the present I wanted. And then about, you know, I don't know, not long after they've calmed down and then they say, you know, I really love you, mummy, if you go and buy me that present I asked for. So they can sw- switch very quickly between yeah. very intense primitive emotions of what I'm calling love and hate here. And as we get socialized and grow up, if you like, go through the teenagers, which we'll talk about in a minute, yeah. romantic hate and love, if you will, and they grow up, they start to um, dilute those words. Yeah. And they use then words, you know, like we are talking about here, frustrated or fondness. 
or kindness and you know they it becomes a, a, a moderation of language however if you go beneath that to a more um, child-oriented state often the language of hate and love is there yeah and like you said in the therapy room you know one of the things that I often do is look at the ego states and where they're coming from and like you say well, if it's strong emotion they're usually coming from a younger part yeah and you know that that love whether whichever way you're interpreting it you know it it can be around looking for recognition and validation in the therapy room from the therapist as well yeah and when they don't get it and get yeah. very disappointed yeah. under the disappointment can often be dislike under the dislike can be i'll use the word quite deep primitive uh hate yeah and hate simply means an intense emotion of disappointment irritation if you want towards the other it's it's actually you know towards the other person yeah it's an innate object when people use the word hate they don't say well i hate my car or you know they're talking usually about another person in yeah. therapy particularly when we're working developmentally in the transference with the younger self um clients can feel intense feelings towards their therapist such as love and in the negative transference hate yeah so so what what do we do about that do we do we challenge it in the therapy room do we i know we we explore it do we do we question it I often ask clients, you know, how would I know if you were feeling an emotion? Like, how would I know if you were angry at me? I've never really asked them, what would I see if if you hated me or hated therapy or hated something? Oh, right. Um, what's the question? I've got that statement, but what's the question? Would we... I don't know whether we'd challenge it in the therapy. Is it something that you would bring up in the therapy session? That's the question. Okay, let me take a statement. I think love and hate is always there. Okay. Now, it may be as as we're dealing with adult ego states, for example, the A's they are in the room, they may use words like irritation. They may use, may use words like frustration. They may use older words, more sophisticated words. But if you're going to work developmentally with the child, younger self, regressively, when you're working, say, with the mixture of feelings, let's take of love or idealization or desire of the uh, towards the mother that they never had, that can quickly turn to disappointment and under na underneath that extreme dislike or even hate because they feel so let down, yeah, so disappointed, so hurt. So the three-year-old, the seven-year-old could easily go to those real intense primitive feelings of hate underneath the disappointment or love uh, at the desired object they never had. When you're working with the younger self aggressively, then you're working with primitive feelings often. Yeah, which are intense. That that's that's the nature of them, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. So if we're working developmentally with the younger self, we will be covering usually very intense emotions. Yeah. So so the feelings of love, hate, usually at the idolised or disappointed other, is often very common. Which in the therapy room, are you saying that's aimed at us as a therapist? Often, because in the transference, if you step into the transference, you are, in inverted commas, taking the place of the object of yesterday okay that's a that's a lot for us to 
Harry in the therapy room. <laughs> Depends how you work, Jackie, you see. If you're going to work developmentally in the regressive process towards integration and taking back the disowned, fragmented parts of the self within the transference, then these are the sort of primitive emotions which are going to occur. Is it a burden? I think if you've got a contract for transferential work, I see it as part of the therapeutic process which I've been trained in. I don't really see it as a burden unless we're talking about really disturbed primitive objects, which I then take personally rather than professionally. Yeah. For example, if hatred is directed to me within the transference, from a younger split off part of the self, then that's a professional process. I understand it professionally. You know, it's not that I suddenly somehow take that personally because I understand it's not me that they're directing that emotion at. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's different from, uh, you know, if I wasn't the therapist in that moment working developmentally and aggressively. If I'm Bob Cook and from their Adelaide Eagster, they start projecting hatred that I haven't made them a cup of tea or I haven't opened the door for them or something like that. That's a different, absolutely different process. And I'd be taken back unexpectedly because I'm not in the transferential therapeutic contract that we aim for. Okay. So when I work regressively, I don't take that burden of responsibility you're talking about because I've got a contract where I'm working in a specifically different way. Now, if we are then move away from the regression and the developmental process I'm talking about, and we're working adult to adult, say, in the therapeutic room, and then there's a sudden outburst, then that's a different story for me. I see it differently. Okay. See, I was thinking more about when, when I looked at the topic of this, I was thinking more about, you know, playing out the the script patterns in the therapy room and things and oh. being kind of, I don't, I don't know, manipulative with emotions in the therapy room. Now, this is very important. Do you mean, the, okay, do you mean the psychoanalytical word of manipulation? Because if you do, and that is uh, manipulation unconsciously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Evidence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. By the client to manipulate the therapist to confirm their life script. Yeah. And that's very, very common projections. Yeah. So if you think about it, all right, think about it in terms of neglect. Let's pick something. Neglect. Yeah. yeah. You've got a client that's been very neglected. They feel unwanted. They feel as if they don't have purpose in life. They feel worthless. They feel lack of self-esteem. They wonder what's wrong with them because their mother and father or whoever neglected them. And therefore, as they continue in life, they decide there's something wrong with me. And also, you know, the world's against them, et cetera, et cetera. So they then look for relationships where they can play that process out, confirm their identity, sense of predictability, and they project onto their new romantic relationships that you're always going to neglect me. Yeah, or that they're unworthy of love or they're unlovable or something along those lines. Yeah. yeah, yeah. By definition, they will attempt to manipulate the therapist to confirm what they think about self, life, and other people. Yeah. Now, the therapist's job is, unless they want to move in the transference and go developmentally, the therapist's job is to stay outside the transference, be aware of the manipulation, and um, help the client understand what is past and what is present. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what I was thinking about. And, you know, yeah, look, it's unconscious or whatever, but looking at, you know, 
whether they're being criticized or rejected or you know whatever it is in the therapy session and being kind of super sensitive to anything that yeah. that comes up for them like that and then you know they, they either feel loved or hated in that session and that can dictate yeah. Well, what? Jackie, yeah. you know, you you know, Jackie, you know, you don't love me anymore. And I know you don't love me anymore because you didn't make me a cup of tea. You made Jackie, you made John a cup of tea. You didn't ask me if I wanted a cup of tea. And I don't love you anymore. I think you actually hate me. Yeah. I think you hate me. So I'm going to leave therapy now. Goodbye. Yeah, absolutely. Now or you've not asked very... me how my week's been or, or whatever. Yeah. That's the rage of the five year old. Mm hmm not the 39 year adult yeah how you respond is crucial absolutely crucial so how would you respond i'll tell you how i would respond <laughs> Some of you. i'll tell you how i would respond Rob. I would respond to the person i understand you feel that way and i'd like you just to come back into the room or, con or let's talk about this in the dialogue. And I want to help you understand the difference between perhaps what was missing yesterday and your intensity of feelings on me today. It's probably how I might respond. Yeah. I think I'd ask, you know, for, for them to maybe identify or look at the feeling and see when, you know, they've felt that feeling before, when they felt that way before and what was going on for them then or or something along those lines. So you're doing the same thing. It might be yeah, different. yeah. You're doing exactly the same thing. It's helping them understand where their feelings have come from, which yeah. are so intense in the moment. Yeah. So you're helping them distinguish between past and present and the next step is, is this familiar for you in your relationships today when you feel so discounted or hurt? Yeah, I have had clients where and it's it's hard as I'm saying it now, I'm thinking, was it me or was it them? I don't know. But where I've kind of felt like they've tried to get me on the back foot in the therapy session like yeah. they came with a mission <laughs> to direct me down a certain route and if i'm not prepared to go there then they don't like it if that makes sense yeah what they do is they up the stakes yeah and yeah i, I physically felt that yeah. in the session yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah your job as a therapist is to help them understand what this what is happening between the two of you us now in the room yeah is it familiar yeah to anything in your past and help them put the two together yeah because only then can they move forward absolutely absolutely and when i'm talking with clients about you know a game playing and things like that i think they think it's a conscious thing that they're doing and it's like no this is not this is not a conscious thing this is you know, an, an unconscious replaying of something that we all do. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So you've got many ways to do this. You can invite them back into adults to have an almost adult to adult discussion with the focus being educative therapy. Yeah. Where you put those two together. Yeah. Or if you are a therapist that has the contract to work developmentally and aggressively, you might step into the transfers and say, you know, when you talk to me like this, who are you actually seeing and relating to? Is it me or is it somebody in your past which has treated you with such a familiar, neglectful, discounting way? Yeah. So you lower your voice because you're going towards the child eager state. Your language becomes more intense and slowed down. And you aim it developmentally at the child eager state, the younger self, where your client has moved to, because that is where the healing is, in my opinion. Yeah. Now, you can work um, many different ways. 
Um, but one thing I do know is the primitive emotions of love and hate will so easily be projected onto the therapist if the client moves into the younger self to replay the script which may be so destructive to them in the here and now. And it's the job of the therapist to help the client heal from that fragmented process. And I think needs to go back to where it first started. Yeah. Yeah. And it's individual for each client as well. This is, I find this bit interesting that how, how they need love showing to them is different for everybody. You, you know, whether it's doing something for them or the words that you use or being empathic or caring, how they receive that is different for each client. Does that make sense? Yes and no. Okay. Because I know for me, I feel no, love. No, start with the, start with the <laughs> tell well, me along the way. Give me some examples. For me, I know I feel loved when I feel like I've been seen and heard. And how and what needs to happen. So give me an example of that. When you say see, when you've been seen and heard, what do you mean? It's very difficult to pinpoint it, but... Over the course of a relationship, it's when people remember certain things. Like I, I've I've impacted on them in some way. They, they know my likes and dislikes and, and things like that, if that makes sense. Mostly, it go, why I said yes or no, is mostly this goes back to the misattunement of the significant caretakers with the infant. Yeah. That's why I said yes, because his similarity is the the actual misattunement in their earlier years. And then when I said, you see, that's what I think this is about. Now, at the same time, in a different polarity, everybody has their own unique history. Yeah. In relationship with their significant others, which will be different from other people. And at the same time, we all have similar themes, discounted, neglected, Abs not yeah. heard. Yeah. So that's why I said yes and no. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I'm really conscious and put an awful lot of effort with my clients that they do feel, you know, seen and heard and like I've listened to them and I've taken things on board, you know, rem remembering significant dates for them and things like that it, it's quite important for me that they feel counted for in the therapy room yeah one level great jackie fabulous by the way because i think that shows a great sense of thinking about them a great sense of your clients being important to you i i like all those things and you can never get it right for your clients because you're not the original caretaker. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, and I'm not perfect, yes. so I'm not going to get it right, and I will miss things, absolutely. Yeah, and when you and the cure is that when you miss them, you say, I hear that I didn't pass the handkerchief to you when you were so hurting. Is this similar? in any way mm. to the herd from yesterday. Yeah. So it, it's interesting. And as you're saying that, it, it kind of reconfirms that every opportunity in the therapy room is a, is an opportunity for therapy, if that makes sense. Whether we get it right, whether we get it wrong, whatever, it's always an opportunity. Always. I'm, I was known as a therapist, and I still am, as someone... In works developmentally going to the child ego state at every opportunity yeah yeah and so the work i do is a lot in the child ego state and you are completely right everything that happens in the therapy room is grist to the mill yeah get back to the hurts of yesterday which get played out in different ways 
less dramatic usually in the here and now with the therapist yeah and i i've been witness to that bob in in the training that we did with you i've done one of your three day therapy marathons and i've <laughs> i've not only been part of it myself but i've witnessed it with other people the 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 magic that occurs when you do that i can remember once and i'm sure i've mentioned this in a podcast 12 months ago or whatever literally sitting on the couch with you and all you did was move the box of tissues closer to me and the effect that that had on me was unbelievable and i still to this day have no idea why <laughs> because it's an invitation to your childhood it's an invitation to the younger part who were who was so missed yeah and it hits it hits literally but something what you know when i'm in my adult something that's so simple as moving a tissue box oh, yeah. a little bit closer had such an impact on me in that moment yeah so when we get onto the podcast title which i've given you uh i don't know when we'll get onto it which is called <laughs> tissues and tea in the psychotherapy room love it about this i've sent you the title i think i don't know when we'll get down to it. tissues and tea in the psychotherapy room and this is what i'm talking about now well, you're a master at that bob different therapists work different ways i was always trained to work this way and i've developed my own stuff and i still do these psychotherapy intensives by the way i've got one coming up in uh you know a lot long i do three a year um and of course i'm mainly a supervisor now i miss those therapy intensives when you know, I'm talking about them in the podcast, uh, which we're doing now. But that's how I see love and hate. They're very primitive emotions with intense feelings, which are usually really raw in our younger selves, uh, get played out in different ways in the present. Teenagers. Teenagers. That first romantic love, that mm. real intense emotion. I'm not talking about the romantic love, I'm uh, sorry, the mother uh, three year old relationship. I'm talking about the romantic girlfriend, boyfriend, 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 girlfriend. What those adolescent first loves, they are such strong, intense relationships, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Which can switch so quickly. Yeah. When they get so disappointed. I hate you. You didn't phone me at 10 o'clock last night, and I stayed up till 10 15. 10.20 and you still done for me and whatever you do I'm never going to speak to you again yeah it's very oh. black and white that's it it's total I'm never ever ever going to speak to you again <laughs> yeah. oh I'm so sorry I was just I was just talking to a friend of mine I'm so sorry I will never do it again well you never better do it again but you know I love you after all don't you yeah there's the intense there's the switch of the intense and primitive emotions between love and hate, which are often played out in the therapy room, especially with therapists who work developmentally with the younger parts of the self in the service of healing. Yeah. And helping the client understand the difference between or similarities between past and present. It's a really good topic. It, 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 yeah, it's one that I don't really think about that much, but it's, it's definitely in the therapy room a lot. Yeah. Of course, what you said early on this podcast, and I, I sort of complimented on you. You said you were a therapist that thinks about your clients, that thinks about validation, thinks about attunement, thinks about not repeating history. Mm. And actually, not only will you repeat history because they have to have you repeating history to yeah. actually get some healing um and you cannot get it right and in fact in many ways the opportunity comes when you don't get it right yeah i agree yeah no it's true um, and it's about using that as as an opportunity in the therapy room not necessarily getting it wrong on purpose but when you do to use that in a positive uh, way, yeah. On, by the way, you might want to get it wrong when, you know, the young, the, the client who, from their younger self, idolises you because you are providing a recorrective experience for them. 
okay? You might want to get it wrong to help them get in touch with the other side of this, which is the disappointments, the uh, when somebody's not perfect. And somebody, like all parents, aren't perfect. No, absolutely. When they're not perfect, when you're not perfect, and help them understand this. But you'll need to go to the child first to do the healing in the process. So you are right. You're absolutely right. The opportunity, you need to look out for the opportunity to see yeah. uh, to see when the manipulation or to see when you haven't matched up in the therapy room, which inevitably will happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you need to look out for. So we've ended up. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I hate you or love you, Jack, at this moment, but I'm quite happy to end the post. <laughs> <laughs> we've run out of time. Okie doke, Bob. Until next time, when we will be looking at working with loneliness as a clinical oh, condition. Oh, gosh. I look forward to that, I think. Okie doke. Until next time, Bob. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode. <laughs>